Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Elvin Taylor. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. The next hour is devoted to learning something more, not just about the world of shoes and ships and sealing wax, but about how, what, and why we believe as we do. A time for the open-minded willing to challenge some of those old ideas behind what we think we know, who we are, and who we might just become. I'm Eldon Taylor, and this is Provocative Enlightenment. All right, our chat room is open, and my partner Ravinder awaits you there now. You can log on by going to provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. We do have a great chat room, so Ravinder, tell us all about it, please. Yes, we have a fabulous chat room, a fabulous group of people, lots of information, lots of education, lots of humor that comes out in the chat room. So do come join us. Uh, that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. <clears throat> and if you can't join us live because you are driving or you're at work and your boss doesn't like it, uh, you can always check the chat log afterwards because we will often post uh, extra earls and extra information and stuff in there. So that is provocativeenlightenment.com forward slash chat. All right, good. This week I wish to address... The unimaginable power of the mind, if you will. I recently encountered a young person who complained about his genes. He genuinely believed that he was a defective human being because his parents passed on genes that might be implicated in several disease potentials. He was certain he would encounter one or more of these diseases at some point in his life. Technology today provides each of us with a look at our heritage. If you check the consumer information page of the Federal Trade Commission, you will find that some companies say genetic testing, or more commonly called direct-to-consumer, DTC, genetic testing, can screen for diseases and provide a basis for choosing a particular diet, dietary supplements, lifestyle change, medication, and so forth. However, the government page warns that these claims are often exaggerated and further that the interpretations of genetic data are far from perfect. Set that aside for a minute. For it's my contention that as much as your genetic power, it's the power of your mind that ultimately may control the expression of your genes. Indeed, some new and exciting work in epigenetics has demonstrated exactly this. According to many scientists, and I'm quoting now, contrary to what many people are being led to believe, a lot of emphasis placed on genes determining human behavior is nothing but theory and doctrine, writes Konstantin Erikson. He continues, and I quote, We are free to make decisions that impact our lives and those of others. Our beliefs can change our biology. We have the power to heal ourselves, increase our feelings of self-worth, and improve our emotional state. The old dogma regarding genetic expression has really been shattered. Quoting from a McCorla article, in the featured piece, Erickson describes the experiments of John Carnes, a British molecular biologist who in 1988 produced compelling evidence that our responses to our environment determine the expression of our genes. A radical thought, for sure but one that has been proven correct on multiple occasions since then. Erickson writes, quote, Carnes took bacteria whose genes did not allow them to produce lactase, the enzyme needed to digest milk sugar, and placed them in a Petri dish where the only food present was lactase. Much to his astonishment, within a few days, all of the Petri dishes had been colonized by the bacteria and they were eating lactose. The bacterial DNA had changed in response to its environment. This experiment has been replicated many times and not found a better explanation than the obvious fact that even primitive organisms can evolve consciously. I've written much about the power of your mind and often cited studies such as that of David Phillips at UC San Diego, who demonstrated that expectation alone could decide what you would suffer from and what you would die of. I've also discussed the failure of the so-called hardwired gene power 
to control eye color of multiple personality disordered patients. The fact is, the power of your mind can not only affect the manifestation of your genetics, it can alter your brain, increase gray matter, rewire cognitive processes, and so much more. Your thoughts are becoming real every single day of your life. This is why I created the patented InterTalk technology to assist us all in gaining control over all of those programmed ants or automatic negative thoughts that scamper around in our heads. So today's message is this. Please do remember that thoughts are indeed things and their power to impact your life for good or bad rests within your choice. So please choose to prosper in all ways. Your thoughts on this one, Ravinder? Oh, expectation plays a huge role in uh, what you can expect to expect to experience in your life. Um, you know, some of the science behind it, um, yeah, I mean, I, I can dig around, I can question a whole lot more. You know, my own background in microbiology, and you talk about the bacteria changing, well, my immediate first reaction, of course, is contamination. Um, and then it's like, well, what type of gene or what, you know, so there's always arguments around it. But in the real world, you do see lots of people, there's lots of situations where um, the person with an optimistic attitude in a hospice experiences less pain than the uh, person with a pessimistic attitude. You know, the attitude influences a lot. You know, there are lots of stories of self-healing. The power of the mind is um, absolutely immense and... Uh, I think that is our most vital treasure that we have. We need to take care of it and uh, program it correctly. Don't let others program it for you. And now, in all fairness, so there's mis no misunderstanding, Carnes' research with bacteria has been tightly controlled for any kind of uh, contamination in multiple replications because it was so earth-shattering. That's what makes so, it so intriguing. You know, more yeah. than two dozen replications, no contamination. Indeed, this is an evolution, if you will, in the nature of that particular um, bacteria. Okay? That, yeah, that's really cool. All that's right. Amazing. Every week I read some of your letters as our way of involving you while paying respect to the very important role you play in making this show successful. Our last live show featured Dr. Elliot Dacker, and we spoke about his book, Awake, Aware, Alive. Jackson wrote, loved your show with Dr. Dacker. I wish my doctor practiced his kind of medicine. You know, I'm kind of lucky I have a, a physician that does practice that kind of uh, medicine. But I'll tell you what, and, and I'm sure Ravindra will vouchsafe this one. If your doctor doesn't, find another one. Absolutely. They're like plumbers. No, <laughs> they can't be. They can, if you have the wrong kind of doctor, that's exactly you know, all very very mechanical. You need someone who's going to work with you. You find the right doctor, yeah. You Make can a huge anything, difference. Yeah. All right, Loretta wrote. I so enjoyed this interview. Thank you, Alden and Ravinder, for this wonderful program. Naomi wrote. I was feeling so upset about the cyborg possibility you wrote about, but after listening to the latest show with you and Dr. Elliot, I relaxed. What such wonderful perspective. Machines created by the human mind. But how long will we use technology not to help us become better, but instead to run away from ourselves, our soul, and spirit? Moving on. Vanessa wrote, I love your InterTalk products, Eldon. I've noticed real shifts and change. Dan wrote, thank you, Eldon, for extending your intentions. Please continue to feel the love, be the love, extend the love. And Mary wrote, Dear Dr. Taylor, I had to let go of my precious German Shepherd today, and I thought of you and your chief. I had the wonderful opportunity to chat with you at Hay House in 2014 in Pasadena before one of your lectures. Once again, your words, God winking, have provided me with the courage and gratefulness today, and I know I will also get a sign that he is just fine. Thank you for all of your inspiration. You really do touch hearts. That... That is one of the hardest things I think we deal with, you know, the passing of our pets. And we tend to dismiss that. Uh, we tend to think of the passing of a loved one as being another human being. But uh, especially when you're in a situation where you have to make that call about putting them down or not, that is, uh, you need that God wink. Don't you agree, Rav? Absolutely. All right. That's all the time we're going to take for letters today. But I do invite you to opine by sending your comments to Eldon, that's E-L-D-O-N, at eldontaylor.com, 
or by joining me on Facebook. And I want to thank all of you for your letters and comments. We truly do appreciate your feedback and support. Now to this week's show, Unspoken Messages with my friend Richard Rowland. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest. He is a two-tour veteran of the Vietnam War who was diagnosed with a rare blood cancer related to exposure to dioxin, commonly known as Agent Orange. He is also a retired sergeant from the Kentucky State Police following a 28-year career in law enforcement. Fifteen years ago, he started a horse boarding training foaling facility in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, where until very recently he resided with his wife Jennifer and son Richard. I had the good fortune to read Richard's new book, Unspoken Messages. I loved the book and encouraged him to find a publisher. Bernie Siegel had this to say about his new book. Quote, Richard is what I call a survivor, and his words can teach us to be survivors too. He is a wounded healer, ready to serve. Close quote. I believe the unspoken messages in Richard's book teach us of our responsibility to meet life in a certain way. I'm going to let him explain to us, unpack exactly what that certain way is. So on that, let's get him in here. Welcome to Provocative Enlightenment, Mr. Richard Rowland. Good afternoon, Eldon. So good to be here. Oh, it's good to have you, my friend. And hey, Listen, we haven't talked in a while. I mean, we, we share notes back and forth, but how have you been? And I understand you just moved to Maine like two days, three days ago. That's a huge change from the ranching stuff, isn't it? Oh, what's going on? <laughs> It, it, it has been a massive life change. Um, um, I think moving is probably one of the most stressful things you can undertake. So I'm very grateful for the gift that you sent me. Uh, it, it apparently helped because I've made it through this, and, and we're we're in Maine now. Uh, it's a matter of getting unpacked and, and making a home ours. Cool. Why Maine, Richard? Well, uh my wife's folks are in their 80s, uh, uh-huh. one upper 80s, one mid 80s, and they have reached a point in life where they need help, and uh, there there were no options but us. So uh, we decided that we were going to sell the the ranch in Kentucky and move up here to to take care of them. That's great. That's really great. Uh you know, you and I share many things in common. Our love for animals, ranching background, law enforcement, da-da-da. Um, and, and I don't know, maybe that's what kind of drew us together. I'm not sure. Uh, but you share a number of stories in your book about animals. And, uh, you know, incidents um, that, you know, are the unspoken messages that arrive from Animals, and you heard the setup piece in the letter that I received regarding God wings. If you had to choose one of these incidents as the most important in your life or the most meaningful, what would it be? From the book, at the the very first chapter in the book, I would suppose uh, was and is the most deeply spiritual thing I've ever experienced, and, and I tried to relay that to other people uh, by writing about it. And it was also a major turning point in my life to experience something uh, like what I experienced. And then it was it was not humorous, but it was funny in a way as I was reading some of your books to find out that you and I shared the same experience I wrote about uh, with horses. Uh, it, it, uh, it was a life-changing moment from what occurred. For our audience, Richard, uh, unpack that story. You know, retell the story, please. We we take care of horses for other people. We, we did some uh, training and, and from early on, mostly in the cutting horse field. Uh, but later in life, I, I reached a point where I just wanted to, to board and give free advice. So we were taking care of one particular horse from a fellow that lived in Connecticut. Very expensive horse, very valuable, in foal. Um, it had a foal. foal. Foal was born there a couple of weeks before this incident took place. And she received an injury, uh, to brief things up just a little bit, and it was a, it was a life-changing, a, a life-ending injury. Uh, no matter what we did, we, we had veterinarians there that were consulting with the owner in, in Connecticut and us, and we reached a point 
point where we knew that, that the only option was to put her down. Uh, and nobody wanted to do that. This was just a really super horse, one of those once-in-a-lifetime things. Uh, so when we reached the decision, it, it, it had already became pitch dark. New moon night, very little light. Uh, light around the barns was about it. There were 19 other horses uh, at the stables at that time, but they were all situated all around the barns. The barns is central to everything else. And uh, so they couldn't see us. Uh, they didn't have any idea what was going on, or, or so I thought. This was early in my transformation of becoming mm-hmm. somebody that sees the grays in between the black and white. And uh, when you when you put a large animal down, it's a two-shot process. You, you have... Uh, one shot that sedates and knocks them out, and another shot that, that actually stops the heart from beating. But with the first, just before the first shot, the mare called. There's a special little rumbling noise they make for their foals. And the foal walked over, and, and her and the mare had some kind of an interchange, and then the foal walked away. And the vet administered the first shot. And uh, as soon as I mean, this is just like a switch being turned on. As soon as the needle went in her neck for the first shot of sedation, 19 other horses at the stables went just berserk. It was it was such a den of running and dust and nickering and whinnying that went on and on. I've never experienced anything in that like that in my life. No other reason for anything like that to happen. I'm still one of those people that that part of me wants to search for a scientific reason for something sure. to happen, even though I'm becoming I, I became somebody who who no longer really looks for that reason. Uh, things are as they are, and uh, when the shot, the last shot was administered that stopped her heart, uh, and she passed away. The same switch that turned on to start all this noise and interaction from the other horses turned off. And all at once, everything stopped, and it was complete silence. No noise at all. And you have five other people standing there that are experiencing all this, so I wasn't by myself. Uh, There were other people. And I don't remember who said it, but somebody said, what was that? I think everybody there had goosebumps and hair standing up because the, the realization was that we just witnessed something that was pretty special. And and like you wrote in in your book about the same type of incident, and it was this was in a communication, not on a a, a verbal or, or a noise level. This is a deeper communication between souls. And I to believe I, I came to believe, and I still believe to this day that that horses are much more evolved than we've ever given them credit for. I think horses are all souls. I think horses have a way of communicating. If we can accept that and look for their cues as they communicate. And I believe I witnessed something that was just really special, and it set me on a journey of uh, several things that that began to happen that brought my science-based ideology to question and made me believe more in, in the spiritual part of, of life, and it it, it it changed me, and it it brought the book about that 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 uh, was the beginning of the book because it was such a such a special thing that happened. I had to I had to write it down, and when I wrote it down, I I let a few people read it, and they said you need to write a book. You I I don't take any credit. This this happened, and I'm a storyteller, so. I relayed what happened on paper. I I don't profess to be a writer or an author, but I'm a storyteller. And that's what occurred, and that's what started this journey. You're a great author, and and I love your book, and you know that, Unspoken Messages. And and you did. uh, You know, as you point out, I experienced almost exactly that same thing with the mare and her foal, a mare that died in my arms. and some 50 horses in my barn uh, immediately responded and and there is no way to explain that short of these animals communicate at a level that doesn't require 
vocalization of any kind. They somehow knew what was happening with this mayor in a, in a very quiet way. And, uh, and that suggests a level of, of, of communication that's, I guess we could say telepathic, or as you say, at a soul level. And experiencing that is a life-changing kind of thing. I mean, let me ask you this, Richard. You were a rancher, so your business was commercial. And, you know, my ranch was also commercial. And uh, it was stallion station, racing stable, and, you know, and we did, you know, breeding there. So we did boarding of mares. But our business was all, it was all a business. And as much as I loved horses at the time, I could find myself blind to my love by the nature of business. One of the things that, that, tortures me as, as recently as last night indeed thinking about today's show is that I, I remember um, a two-year-old leopard appaloosa stallion that I bought out of an auction that was a halter champion up in Montana it was a gorgeous horse everything was right about this horse it was a kind horse there was no no meanness no one and, and the horse was started very well under saddle and i looked at this horse and said you're not a national halter champion stallion but you are a national halter champion gelding i'm going to geld you and we'll take you all the way well we gelded the horse and the next day he was still bleeding so i ran him immediately to the vet but i had also a business meeting and the vet said oh we can take care of it we'll pack him we'll take care of him that horse bled to death in a stall in the vet's office where there was only one guy to answer the phone and do everything else. Uh, To this day, I punish myself over that. It was like I made a business decision about a life, not about a thing. It wasn't a car. And, and, and I took his life in that process. And, and, and that, that I find that to be one of the most horrible things that I've ever done in my life. Did you ever make any of those kinds of decisions? Did they bother you, Richard? I have managed to reach a point in life where I've looked back without regret and, and accepting of everything that happened as what was supposed to happen. Uh, maybe maybe I'm beginning to believe that, that the life that I experience is what I asked to experience. Uh, I, I know some things you can change, but as far as uh, making, I've made a lot of wrong decisions. Uh, I think any time you're involved in <clears throat> what's referred to as the animal industry or the equine industry or, or any of them, you're going to make decisions uh, that affect other lives. And there are going to be times that's that's a bad decision or you're going to look back on it as it's a bad decision. And I think now with the new mindset that I possess, I'm, I'm more inclined to believe that the soul that was in the Appaloosa that you're talking about wanted to go and it was it was its time regardless of health or anything else and and that was the way it happened well that gives me some peace let me ask you this you wrote a poem a poem from your heart you say i read about in your book when uh, when you put kate down Uh uh another one of your horses uh you say you cut off a piece of her mane and tail and took them with you as you return to the house and then you wrote a poem i'm not a poet i'm quoting now i'm not a poet it may sound juvenile but the words came from somewhere deep inside me do you still have that poem i do i don't i don't have it beside me at the moment but i do still have that poem and and the our son uh, graduated from college a year ago may and started teaching that next fall Uh, so he had he has moved on and moved out has his own place so the part of kate that still exists hangs in his house now along with that poem that's all framed in a shadow box together you're gonna have to send me a copy i need to see that if you will my friend i can tell you that once upon a time had exactly that experience and uh again it was over the loss of uh a, a dear friend an equine friend and uh Whenever I think about it, it brings tears to my eyes still to this day because I know I didn't write it. I didn't write it at all. It, uh, 
it wrote itself. Yeah. As things come and you you don't know where they come from. I, was, I tell people when I started writing the book that there were days that I would write for 12 to 14 hours and I had no idea where the words were coming from. They they came rapidly. It was all I could do to keep up with with the thought process. Of course, there was a lot of cleanup and redo and, and other things later, but uh, originally... There, it, it was a real fast process of, of many days spent, uh, many hours in front of a word processor writing. Your book is a marvelous book. Again, it's Unspoken Messages. We've got a break coming up. You were told you basically were terminal. Animals have taught me many things. I don't know the animals bridged a change for you in your life that assisted you in dealing with the announcement of your cancer when we come back, I want to take that on. Let's go right to it. We're speaking with Mr. Richard Rowland about his life and new book, Unspoken Messages. I cannot strongly or too strongly recommend this book. I invite you to check the book out online at Barnes or Amazon. There are some informative reviews there, and I know you'll love his insights. Do stay tuned. We'll be right back. You're listening to Provocative Enlightenment with Elton Taylor. Change has never been easier. Whether you wish to lose weight, stop smoking, build better relationships, become creative, enjoy ultra prosperity, or simply relax and promote self-healing, InnerTalk has been repeatedly demonstrated effective in the most rigorous of scientific studies. Our customers love InnerTalk. Sean wrote, I have struggled with bulimia for over 30 years and have never been able to lose weight without restoring to it until I used InnerTalk. Vicki wrote, My hubby has been using the Stop Snoring CD, and already his dangerous and raucous snoring levels have stopped. Celeste wrote, I recently graduated from Taft Law School with honors. I'm writing to tell you how much your inner talk CD, Excel in Exams, has helped me. With over 300 titles to choose from, there is something for everyone. Check it out today by going to innertalk.com. Unlock the power of your mind. This is Provocative Enlightenment with Alvin Taylor. And welcome back. If you just joined us, we're chatting with Richard Rowland about his life and new book, Unspoken Messages. Now we ask our guests for their favorite music, music that has some genuine significance to them. Music psychology is a new hobby of mine, and it's a field of research with practical relevance in many areas, including investigations of human aptitude, skill, intelligence, creativity, personality, social behavior, and much more. All right, we just played some of Live Like You Were Dying, some by Tim McGraw. So please tell us, Richard, why is this music important to you, and how does it instruct us about who you are? It's important to me because people get caught up in yesterday and tomorrow, and they they kind of lose sight of what's important, and that's right now. And if if you live your life, if you're lucky enough to live your life as if you were dying, you're going to have a much happier and a much longer uh, lifespan. Not to mention, you're going to have a lot of fun because you're going to do the things you want to do instead of doing the things you feel like you have to do. I couldn't agree more, and I do love that song myself. All right, look, I'm going to I'm going to start this one off with a quote from you. I have no doubt you have wondered what could have happened in my life to change the black and white, right or wrong, hard-headed, curmudgeon person you knew and tolerated into the person I am today. Let's start right there. Okay, two tours in Nam, 28 years with a highway patrol. You've pretty well seen the dark side, as dark as it gets, wherever it gets in the world. And, uh, you know... That's not who you are today. What brought about the change? What what was the catharsis that uh, 
was it sudden? Was it one thing? Did it accumulate? Uh, flesh that out for us, please. There was, when I first received the diagnosis, Eldon, uh, number one, it's an, it was an unsolicited prognosis that I received that, I, that I've grown to have problems with them being issued to other people because I, I feel like uh, there is a seed planted with an unsolicited prognosis. So that said, there, there was a point in time where I was at home by myself, and uh, I'm not a religious person. But I, I was on my knees, and I was crying. And that this is coming from a tough, hard background t- type of person. Uh, but when you face uh, your own mortality, when it really hits you upside the head, <laughs> you you become emotional. And sure. uh, I, I did. But I was screaming at the, at the powers to be in the universe about what I perceived to be the unfairness of, of the whole thing. Uh, I had a son at that time that was a sophomore in high school. Uh, I'm happily married. We have a successful business. Everything that could be right was right, except all of a sudden this was thrown out. And anyway, I, like I said, I was crying and I was on my knees, and I just had this feeling wash over me that things are not what they appear. And uh, it 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 stopped the crying. It stopped the screaming because I'm trying to figure out why would I have a thought like that when when my thought process at the time was pretty much uh, pointedly centered at, at where I wanted it to go. But uh, uh, to have a thought like that, it it set me back on my heels a little. And it wasn't long after that incident took place that that things began to change in my life. Things would happen like the first chapter in the book, that you can't scientifically explain what occurred. And I am a sci- I was a science guy. I was somebody that it had to be, it was black, white, right, wrong. There was nothing in between. I right. had to see proof. And all of a sudden, I started having things happen to me that I could no longer explain. Uh, I don't believe in coincidence. They're not coincidental. There's not a scientific reason for them happening. So there has to be something else to it. And these things happen rapid fire. And and those are the things I talk about. And it also allowed me to revisit other things that had occurred in my life uh, earlier that that I had explained off as being coincidental. Uh, Everything everything changed. In, In the end, after all of the process, after this, this birth of spirituality in me, this belief system that, that I've developed, I came to the point where I, I don't fear death. And when you take fear out of the equation of life, when you take the fear of death out, it's no longer there. You don't fear death. It's the most freeing thing that can possibly ever happen to you. Because I know without a doubt that we transition to something when, when we die. I, I, I'm unsure about what, but I know that there's a continuation. Part of that comes from reading your books, Bernie Siegel's books. Uh, the list goes on and on. Uh, Brian Weiss. There's so many people that have led me <laughs> on this journey, and and I found you through your writings. We developed a friendship through your writings, and and your encouragement has been invaluable. But uh, you, if you take the fear of death out of the equation completely. You're free. You're absolutely free. You, you you believe that something else is going to happen, whether you know what it is or not. Uh, I I don't fear. I, I I try not to fear anything. And I'm not sure everybody you know in our audience might get that. I mean, Agent Orange was uh, that was a pretty bad one. I had a friend. I think you and I've discussed this. Uh, uh, in Vietnam, who um, called an airstrike in after they'd uh, defoilent uh, in after they'd uh, followed a gun run deal into where you're not supposed to be into Cambodia, and uh, he ended up drying his face with his shirt from the defoilent. Um, he died here in the states uh, from leukemia. It was clear that it was induced by the Agent Orange, and of course the government fought all that at the time, denied uh, a lot of the medical benefits and so on and so forth. But 
you know, Agent Orange is a, it was a killer, and you were basically told uh, that you had cancer due to your exposure to Agent, or- Agent Orange, and that was basically a death sentence, was it not? It was. They they told me I received two diagnoses, and of course went for a second opinion. Both were the same, and according to the numbers they saw, their once again unsolicited prognosis about my expiration date was three years. Uh, it did not expect me to see much time beyond that, and it, uh, multiple myeloma, which is what I'm diagnosed with, is an incurable cancer. Right. Uh, that's August will be eight years. Um, so <laughs> my so hard-headedness now, pays off. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I kind of want to distill this. I just want it clear to our audience. I, I want to make sure I understand. So here you are. Now, because you're in law enforcement, forgive me if I say something that's not true of you, you correct me, okay? Because I'm generalizing some. But you're in law enforcement 28 years. You're a bit jaded, you know. You're really careful about who you socialize with. The folks around you that do come by that that aren't your regular friends, you're nervous about what they're going to ask you for. They want you to fix a ticket or some damn thing, right? Right. Okay, so you're a little jaded. You've seen the bad side of things. You're a black and white guy. You you know, you do science. Uh, you've seen the sucky stuff of the universe, and you're given this, this here it is, death sentence. And then suddenly, coincidentally, I don't believe him, we'll just say surreptitiously, or not or serendipitously, you begin to have these experiences. You're on your knees, and there's this overwhelming feeling. And then there's this awareness of a consciousness of these animals possessed that you, you haven't had, and on and on. The stories that you tell in the book, and that's what changed everything for you. Have I got that right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So in that process, then, you decided, I'm throwing out... Uh, allopathic, well, I'm not throwing it out, but I'm going to find alternative medical practices or traditions as well. Tell us about how you turned away from traditional Western medicine to begin that trek. I turned, well, after the diagnosis and being told by uh, specialists that that deal with this disease every day um, that there was very little that they could do for me during this three-year process before I expired, uh, I thought, well, then why would I stay here? If I'm going to die in three years anyway, why wouldn't I go look for something else? Right. And that began the search for alternatives. Now, that's not always, that you can't say that's always the best thing to do because it, it ended up in my case not to be the best thing to do. You've got to find that balance, and that's a very important word on, on this journey, the balance between the best Western medicine has that that you're willing to do the research to find out. Instead of listening to the words, you need to look for yourself. And then the best of alternatives. And in the end, Eldon, I believe it's the power of the mind that drives the cure. It's finding something that you believe in without a molecule of doubt, without any doubt at all. You believe this is going to work, and when you reach that point, it's going to work. And it's your the power within you that that creates the cure. I couldn't concur with that more. I kind of think that I think of that as the divine intelligence within that does all the healing. Once you trust it to do that, uh, once you yeah turn it over. Uh, l- let me ask you this: since you know you you did kind of mention what what kind of other modalities did you use, Richard? Healing modalities. <laughs> Oh, my word, the list goes on and on. I've enjoyed totally every one of them. Uh, Reiki, energy healing, that that deals more with energy from without coming in. Uh, My wife became a practitioner. She is a master Reiki practitioner now. I'm a level two. I was was so impressed with it that I went through some of the training. There's another energy uh, healing modality that's called Jensen Jitsu that deals more with the energy within your body that I use acupuncture weekly. I use massage weekly. 
I've used crystals and stones. I've, uh, I am open to any, almost anything to, to try. And I'm, I'm having such an amazing journey with this. The last, uh, I'm at a point where I have blood tests every, every three months. And the last two blood tests that I've had, the results are absolutely the best. I mean, mind blowingly good, uh, of this whole eight year journey. I'm continuing to, to improve. Our, our, uh, the proteins are still there. It's obvious that I still have them, but they are so that they're, they're, they're not there in force. They're not doing all the damage that they could do. So there are things out there that will work. And I think the most important thing for things to work is the power of your mind to believe that they're going to. So I use a lot of different healing modalities. I also, I have used your CDs extensively uh, to plant, uh, to, to make me realize how strong my mind is and, and how it can change the things within my body. Uh, reading books can be a, a healing in itself because reading books is, is what got me here to anyway. It, it's what made me believe, look at all these highly intelligent, highly uh, educated people that are writing about these things that are almost unbelievable. And and then to do the, the and like you, you supply the research behind the words. Uh, things aren't what I was always spoon-fed to believe. Uh, and I, I think that's part of, I, I think when I honestly think when we come back, when we're born, we still remember what was there before. But as we get spoon-fed beliefs growing up, things change. So we forget who we really are. We forget how powerful we are. We forget that we're a soul that's using a body for a lack of a better way to put it, an educational experience. I think I'm here this time to experience what I came here to experience. I asked for this. Well, I'll tell you, if you asked for it, you are a great teacher, and that must have been the reason you asked for it, so you could teach and share what you're sharing today. Richard, you know, I know the answer to this. I'm going to set you up in a two-part question, but... First part is, look, you know, this is caused by Agent Orange, and uh, everybody was told this stuff was safe, you know, there's nothing to worry about, didn't cause any illness, da 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 and, 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 and the government knew better. I mean, you know, it, it, was, um, it was a lie, and, uh, and a lot of people that experience it, that they hold a lot of anger and a lot of animus towards... Uh, you know, government toward the lie, toward the effect it had on you. So first part of the question is, when you look at the disease, the illness itself, what's your attitude toward it? Do you have any anger directed at uh, those in power who, you know, could have known better than this? And the second part is, the underlying bottom line message in your book has to be how you have coped with all of this and come to where you are. So share that two parts with us, please. Anger fueled change. I think without the anger that I felt at first, when I was first diagnosed, and the anger wasn't towards Vietnam, towards the government. I saw that as a wasted energy to be angry at, at something like that. Uh, it's it's gone, and this is today. The anger was at being diagnosed, uh, having a seed planted, that I'm only going to live so long. That was that was what fueled the anger, and the anger fueled change. It it made me go out and search. It made me look for answers for what does somebody else do when they're facing what I faced. Um, so the anger in in that way was. It was a good anger. It, it brought about a good result. But I have never been anger, angry at uh, the Army, the government. 
uh, at the time, South Vietnam, North Vietnam. And as I have matured through this process, um, I, I don't look back at anything in my life with regret. I think a cancer diagnosis like I received, early in the process I had read in, in many other books that a cancer diagnosis was a gift. And at, at the time when I first read it, I said, no, <laughs> it's a gift I'd just as soon do without. Mm -hmm. I'm happy I was diagnosed with something like this because it gave me a chance to grow and to learn what life is really about, to learn how powerful you are, to learn how you can do change. Um, there are things out there in the alternative world that they are proving uh, it even brings uh, changes on the genetic level to you when you use them. There are so many things out there to experience, but I, I do not look back on my life with anger or regret, either one. I think the anger initially was good because it directed me um, on a certain path, but I, I'm glad that I didn't get angry at anybody else. I, I, I don't want to waste my energy doing that. Great. Let me let me ask you this then, Richard. How important is hope? I I, I, I write about hope because I, I mentor people all around the world right now. People who are facing challenges. Uh, it doesn't have to be this cancer. It can be mental health challenges. It can be heart disease. It can be anything. And and what I my goal for them is to bring hope into their life. I I read some very enlightened people here recently who think hope who who compared hope to a beggar, and that that belief in faith is the, is the main motivators that are going to make you well. And and I disagree with that wholly and totally because I believe hope is the seed that everything else grows from. Hope's lifted on the wings of inner peace. It comes from within you. You you keep it going, and those seeds, if you tend them well, are going to grow into good health and into enlightenment and into spirituality, and, and it's all good things grow from hope. Hope can't die, Eldon. It, it can simply be ignored, but it, it doesn't die. It's always there for you to grab a hold of. And the opposite of hope is helplessness. And the research shows us clearly you lose hope, uh, you become helpless, uh, you lay down and you die. And that's how important it is. The right. book is Unspoken Messages, Spiritual Lessons I Learned from Horses and Other Earthbound Souls. Richard, tell everybody how they can get a copy of the book, learn more about you, if you have a website or email, how they can contact you. Uh, how they can continue this dialogue, my friend. Okay. The book is available uh, through my publisher, which is Balboa Press. It's also available at Amazon, uh, Barnes & Noble. It's distributed through Ingram Distributing. So there's like 14 different uh, retail outlets that, that the book's available through. Um, what was your other question, Eldon? I got, I okay. got lost. Do going you have a website, direction. an email, how people can... Follow up a conversation with you, sir. Okay. The the best way to reach, reach me is is through email, and it's simply spelled out: double d o u b l e r stables s t a b l s b l e s at gmail dot com. And I personally answer all emails that that come into that address. Give it one more time. I'm sorry. Give your email one more time. Make okay. sure they get it. Double. D O U B L E R Stables S T A B L E S at Gmail dot com. Okay, and again the book is Unspoken Messages and I cannot recommend this book any any more than uh, to tell you you owe it to yourself. Read it. You'll love it. Richard, I want to thank you for your willingness to share everything with us today. We've come to the end of another episode of Provocative Enlightenment, and I want to thank all of you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed our show, and will join us again next week, same time and same place. And do tell your friends. Let's have them join us as well. Okay, until next time, wherever you are in the world, remember, believing in yourself always matters.
Provocative Enlightenment has been brought to you by Progressive Awareness Research and other sponsors. Provocative Enlightenment is a syndicated show and appears on other networks. For a schedule of showtimes, visit ProvocativeEnlightenment.com. If you're interested in becoming a sponsor, write to Eldon at EldonTaylor.com.